Um, speaking, of, I got a lot more about TNA, which is kind of funny because this is oh, this was a really good TNA show, and it was actually um, much better than Raw. Now I have some caveats on that score, in that this was a really good show. But they kind of pulled out all the stops on this one and essentially kind of put on pay-per-view matches. And I wouldn't look forward to this being the status quo. For, like, next week you're going to see something a lot like this, or the week after. Like, a month down the line, it's going to be business as usual for fucking Impact. But they did pull out a lot of... They they pulled out all the stops for this one and made this a real spectacle to watch. So, it was good. I'm not saying saying it wasn't good. There were problems, but again, I'm going to explain to you why this isn't going to be good further down the line. Okay. So the first thing that you notice is that uh, I said Hulk got Bubba the Love Sponge a, a job as a backstage interviewer. And if you're Jeremy Borash, I would be worried about my future endeavors. Um, if you don't know who Bubba the Love Sponge is, you're not missing much. But uh, I said he has to be better than fucking Christy Hemi. More about that later. Um, so the first thing they did was, like, the big news is Hogan. Hulk Hogan is coming to TNA Impact. And so they've been hyping this motherfucker for two months. And so they're like, when is Hogan coming? When is Hogan coming? And doing this whole thing like Mick Foley is shitting bricks about when Hogan is coming. Even so much so that like Raven is setting his head on fire. And all that Foley can worry about is when is Hogan coming? That's like, that's how big they've been building this guy up. So Bubba the Love Sponge is interviewing these yahoos out in front of the impact zone. They're like, uh... What do you think is going to happen tonight? Like, what do you like about wrestling? And people are... Like, they had these these idiots out in front who are like, I want to see a return of old school wrestling. I want to see people like Ultimate Warrior, Hulk Hogan, um, the Honky Tonk Man. I want to see chair shots to the head. I want to see brutality. I want to see old school wrestling. And the women there... The, the women in this one were really funny because... They all these women were like, I just want to see wrestling men, oily, sweaty men wrestling each other and rolling around. Ah, it's like the women here came off as really, really shallow, but it was it was kind of funny to watch. But it did not make the the audience of the Impact Zone look like paragons of intellect. And again, I wonder why I watch this sometimes if I have to side with these people. Um, hey, my brother's home. Hey, Miles. Just going over TNA Impact. Did you see it? Uh, Go on. No, you didn't see it yet. He, he's in for a treat. Um, the first match was really, really funny and not a good way to kick off the show. They called it, I, I, don't, I forget what they called it, but I wrote down Steel Asylum Match. It was an X Division match where essentially they put like a domed cage, uh, like Imagine like a pressure cooker where you get like this cage. Like, okay, fuck it. There's a cage around the ring, and on top of the ring they got like this curved dome. Okay, and there's a little hole at the very top of the dome that they have to climb out. That's how I, I wasn't really sure about the rules because they never explain this stuff. It, it, I, I couldn't tell if it was for the title. I think it was, but I couldn't tell. So there was this cage match where they have to climb out through the top of the cage. And so, there was eight dudes in this match, which spells clusterfuck in the X Division. It was the Motor City Machine Guns versus Homicide and Kyoshi of the World Elite versus Lethal Consequences. And by the way, I gotta love Consequences Creed, whose whole gimmick is that he's Apollo Creed. I, I, they just had, they, they, I think they basically, at the first, when he came out, had him come out in like the Apollo Creed, like red, white, and blue top hat, coming down to living in America. Like, that's his whole thing. Like, that's so awesome. They just have like, they have Apollo Creed in this fucking ring. Versus Suicide, the video game character, and the champion, Amazing Red. Um, so, what I really notice about some of these X Division matches is how spotty they are. And by that, I mean. I, I go back to Jackie Chan. One of the worst things that Jackie Ch- like Jackie Chan never likes is a movie where people wait to get hit, where you can clearly see the guy kind of lead his chin out, like waiting to get hit. That's like every X Division match now. Like undeniable athleticism, great stuff going on, but there's a lot of times here where there's a bunch of people just kind of waiting for some guy to jump off the top ropes. And I'm not talking like a second, two seconds. I'm waiting like I'm talking like. Seven to ten seconds of guys kind of like, like 
in Mike Tyson's punch out where the guy's all dizzy waiting for the superpower punch, you know, like they're waiting, they're like, oh, 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 oh. and some guy's climbing the cage and some guy's like waiting, he's like getting ready and the guy's like, oh, 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 and then it hits the 450 splash or something like that. Like that's this entire match. In fact, Alex Shelley spent most of this match just kind of stalling on top of the cage so he could jump on people. He was like Spider-Man up there and as soon as somebody noticed him up there, they're like, oh, hey, you want to jump on me? And Shelly's like, don't mind if I do! And like, does this whole, he does like a hurricane run off the top. So, what was really funny about this match was that Homicide uh, st- whips out a riot baton, like one of those, uh, like the police batons, and he starts going ape shit on people with this police baton. And then all of a sudden, the bell rings! And you're like, the fuck? And the, the, the announcer goes, the referee has ruled this match a no contest. And I didn't know you could do that in a cage match. But apparently you can. Like, I mean, I admit it's shitty for a guy to bring a riot baton into a cage match. It's cheating, sure. But I thought that was kind of the point of the cage match, was kind of like no disqualification. But no, they're like, no contest, this match is over. So, but these guys are still fighting, and then Homicide, like, kills everyone in the ring with this fucking... Yeah, here we go. Here we go. The, the, he hits them with this, you know? So he kills everyone in the ring, and then Homicide's like, Ah! I rule! I'm Homicide! And then he starts climbing out the top of the cage. So he's climbing the cage, climbing the cage. Everyone's dead. And so he starts to try to climb out through the hole, but he can't. Okay? He can't. It, it's it's so awkwardly placed that he's he's kind of too big to wheel his leg over the lip of the entrance and and get out and th- that's kind of supposed to be the finish I think where he he kills everybody in the ring climbs out and kind of stands on top of the cage and then gets jumped because Jeff Hardy all of a sudden like runs out and he's like I'm Jeff Hardy and the crowd is like. Yay! And he's like posing on the ring, and you know he's supposed to jump Homicide, because Homicide is supposed to get out of the cage by now, but he's still like, I, I can't! No! And so, Tanay, Mike Tanay, is trying to buy him time, and I, I, had, I had his quote written down. Um, what'd he say? Oh, Tanay's trying to buy some time by saying, at this point, he's just trying to show off, Taz. And he, like, he is clinging for dear life on the lip of this hole, trying to get his leg over. And, like, yeah, he's really showing off now. <laughs> he's just trying to show off, Taz. And then he falls. But the funny thing is, the, the camera switches away, so they miss him falling. So, all of a sudden, Homicide is clinging to the cage. They cut to, a, they cut to Jeff Hardy or something like that. And then they cut back. And then... And then he's just in the middle of the ring, and all of a sudden they, they, they've they kind of like, the, the other guys in the ring, it's been so long, they, they can't sell this riot baton thing like it's gruesome death any longer, so they're, they're kind of beating on Homicide, and then somehow Homicide is just out of the cage. I, I don't know how, because they keep cutting to Jeff, who's kind of navigating his way through the crowd, and then all of a sudden, Homicide just must have taken the door. Like, he's like, fuck this whole shit, I'm going to go through the door. So he gets out, and then Jeff Hardy's like, hey! And then jumps him. And so they start fighting and fighting. And then Homicide, he, he crushes Homicide with this chair shot to the head that just makes you sick to watch it. And so Jeff sits on top of the cage, and he's like, I'm Jeff Hardy! And people go, yay! That match really sucked! Yeah. Um, Terror versus ODB for the knockouts title. And since this is a big event show, every title is changing hands tonight. So Terra held the title for, what, a week? Um... ODB reverses the widow's peak into a schoolboy. Uh, what was funny here was that when she schoolboyed Tara, Tara, um, she she grabs the tights because she's supposed to be the heel in this match, but ODB is still getting cheered. Like she is supposed to be such a bad guy here, but they're like ODB because they just like chanting ODB. So schoolboy's Tara grabs the tights and pulls so much tights you can basically see her entire widow's crack like you you see all that real estate like just just 12 to 6 it was a full moon that night and so she grabs the tight whoop sorry um she grabs the tights mm. and you see the ass crack okay and you just know someone in that production van was like, "Holy shit! Cut to the cut to the crowd camera." So like, you see 
ass crack and then like crash they crash over to the audience shot where you can't see anything and so you miss the pinfall where it's like you just hear like one two three and then they cut back and they're still ass crack but they kind of pull it over and they're like odb is your knockout chef and they're like ah. <laughs> it was really fun um limo arrives rick flair hops out Ric Flair, which is probably the biggest debut of the night, gotta say. Um, I didn't think they would really do anything with this, and sure enough, they really didn't. Um, there's an interview segment where Christy Hemi see uh, This is earlier in the day where she sees Mick trying to get in the arena, and she says, didn't you get the memo, Mick? And Mick's like, I did get the memo, actually, Christy. They've, I've been barred from the building because... Because I don't like Hulk Hogan, they think I might be disruptive. Uh, you know, God forbid someone be disruptive on a wrestling show! <laughs> um, Bobby Lashley and Crystal come to the ring. Crystal's his wife. And Christy does, Crystal does all the talking in this, in this thing. Um, which is probably a good thing. She says that unlike MMA, wrestling is filled with toothless inbred degenerates. And Bobby has better things to do with his time, so he wants his release from TNA contract. And I was like, this heel turn was totally unprovoked. They just went from, 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 pardon me, they went from Bobby Lashley being like the super baby face to just all of a sudden he's like, Crystal's like, fuck you guys, we want out. And so, you know, this is kind of thing that would be better, better served in, I don't know, a wrestling match. So I really think that uh, from what I've heard, Bobby is supposedly training for an MMA match, and so he really won't be wrestling, and so they probably will just give him his release and just be like, okay, it's over. Um, the beautiful people start playing poker backstage, and apparently they're using stacker five-hour energy drinks as currency because, trust me, you see these fucking stacker drinks everywhere. There's posters of it. They're on TV monitors. They're playing poker, and the only thing on the poker table, aside from the cards and breasts, is stacker five-hour energy drinks. So, buy them. I, you know, fucking buy the, like, the commentators have, like, this, this, this little wall of stacker energy drinks. They might as well have stacker drinks on the ring post that explode when, when Abyss comes out. I don't know. But, it, I don't know if it's a joke or if it's really real that the beautiful people have no idea how to play poker because I think it was like, uh, uh, Velvet Sky deals that each person two cards, and they're like, how many cards do you want? And one of them is like, I want two cards. And then Lacey Von Eric is like, I want five. And so they're like, you can't have five cards? And I was like, what game are we playing? So they say, like, the, the beautiful people are all about the ratings now because they, like, I, I think it was Kevin Nash explained to them, like, good ratings will mean more money for them. And so they do this thing where they're like, we're going to play strip poker, and if you're good, like, if if you keep tuning back, we might show you boobies. And that's, like, their whole gimmick is, like, every week they tease a lesbian kiss between these two, and it never happens. Nobody really believes it's going to happen. And even if it did happen, who cares? Like, as if lesbianism, like, really dry, perfunctory, not even all that hot lesbianism between two chicks on a wrestling show is is all that titillating. Like, I'm going to tune in because the beautiful people are going to kiss. Ooh. You know, nobody cares. Like, it's not going to be like ratings are going to spike because there's a lesbian kiss. You know what? If I really need to see that, I'll YouTube to some bitch. And it's not like, do you really believe for a second they're going to show titties on this thing? No. Like, you're going to see brawn panties. Sure, that's nice. But again, you're not going to be like, I have to watch this show because someone might lose their top. I'm not stupid. <laughs> and, and sure enough, nobody over the entire course of the evening lost a single article of clothing more. So it was either like the slowest, most non-eventful poker game in history of poker. I don't know. So, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, and by the, by the way, it cannot possibly stack up to the, to the poker segment where Trish Stratus lost most of her clothes. That was hot. Um, we'll go back to that. And so, uh, oh, this was, this was the ratings right here. Was, you see Scott Hall and X-Pac. 
they are seen fighting outside with security, trying to get into the impact zone. Oh, goody! Because if there's one thing the wrestling world and the impact zone was screaming for, it was X-Pac. Woo! Yeah, that was like, that's the blockbuster debut. It was like, fuck Ric Flair, we got Scott Hall and fucking X-Pac. Wow. You know, X-Pac, who you might know from such killer classics as, what was it, One Night in China? The China porn video? Woo. You know, and that was probably his best wrestling performance to date because he actually got to see X-Pac wrestle a fucking grizzly bear. <laughs> Whatever, you know. Um, so what was what killed me here was not beyond fucking X-Pac was like, this whole segment where you see them was two minutes long, and then they cut to a commercial break. Five minutes of commercials later, you see Hall and X-Pac somehow got inside. This lasts about 45 seconds, and then they cut to another five minutes of commercials. I was like... <laughs> um, so, Hogan comes out. The, the big moment. Hogan comes out, and he's coming back to this... He's coming back to NWO music, that... You know, that... It's kind of a lame facsimile of the MW, and NWO music, but whatever. He's even rocking the black and white colors, you know? So, he, uh, he, sees, Ho he sees Hall and X-Pac, he's talking, and he's doing this thing where he's like, I'm so glad to be back here, brother! Gonna be big changes! Ah! And... No, his brother, brother, brother thing. And so Hall and X-Pac just decide to jump the rail. And so security stops him. He's like, let my two brothers in, brother. And so they let him in. And Hall and X-Pac, Hall does his hey-yo thing, which hasn't been good ever. And so, so you might be fired up to kind of see these two guys that used to be kind of watchable, except for X-Pac. And so you're like, this is just like WCW. And... Hall is like, hey, this is just like WCW. He's like, you know what we could do? And they never actually say, like, let's bring back the NWO. But Hall is like, you know, you're here, and Six Pac is here, and I'm here, and I'm pretty sure I saw Big Sexy back there, and you know what that means. And Hogan's like, hold on, brother. That's not going to happen. Like, I know we had fun. We had, we had seasoned in the sun. But, brother... I'm all about changes. And then Big Sexy comes out. And he's like, you know, that's not what you were talking about on the phone, dude. You know, you were talking about, you know, the, the good old days coming back. And Hogan's like, you know, uh, he's like, I know what I said, brother, but it's all about changes, brother. And so Eric Bischoff comes out. And you're like, yay. So sure enough, the whole NW NWO gang is back in the ring. And so Bischoff starts doing most of the talking. And he says, Hey, there's been a breakdown of communication, but from now on, everybody has to earn their place in this company. It's like, we're, nobody's going to be handed anything. There's not going to be any, you know, main event mafias. There's not going to be any NWOs. Everybody from the janitor to the, to the top, they've got to earn their place. And Kev surprisingly goes, I hear you. And he calls off the dogs, and the entire NWO group just kind of walks out. So they, uh, they say everyone's going to be under a microscope. Uh, they start screaming for a producer. They tear up the show format, and they're like, we're going to start over. This was pretty good, but we're going to start over. And so they pan over, and you see Sting in the rafters. Yes, Sting still hangs out in the catwalks. Um, more on this in a bit, because this does get better. Uh, they have a knockout tag title match, and I am still amazed that there exists a women's tag team division, which actually says quite a lot about the depth of the TNA roster in a lot of ways, because you would not want to see this in fucking WWE. Can you imagine the Bellas being like a knockout tag team? Ah, no! Seriously, there's like maybe two or three divas in the WWE who can, who can kind of wrestle. There's um, Natalia, who is very good. There's, um, oh fuck, I, I'm, I'm losing, it, it kind of shows you how bad it is when I can't remember anyone. Maurice is okay. Um, yeah, it, it's just really bad, but it, it's actually kind of surprising that all four of these women were really, really good. It was Awesome Kong and Hamada versus Sarita and Taylor Wilde. Was pretty good. 
Then they cut to a backstage thing where the machine guns have been knocked out. That's kind of been a recurring thing this little show. They keep cutting backstage where people have just been fucking killed backstage. So, uh, Kong and Hamada win with a doomsday device kind of thing where... Awesome. So they do like an awesome bomb and a missile drop kick, and it was really spotty here as well because Awesome Awesome Kong had to be kind of just so to hit this drop kick. Uh, and the, the only real story here was um, it kind of seemed like Hamada got hurt. Like I, I, she probably looked like she hurt her leg, which not a good sign. But Hamada is very impressive. Um, oh, here's another thing. Um, they go back to the strip poker where nothing has happened. You know, nobody has lost clothes or energy drinks or whatever. And then all of a sudden, hello, ladies. Um, Val Venus comes in wearing a towel. And he's doing his whole, like, yeah, I'm a porn star thing. And, and one of them is like, hey, you're Val... And, like, Val Venus goes like, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. That name, like, I, we're not using names here. I don't know what I'm being... I don't know what they're going to call me. But don't say the... Don't say that word. Like, don't say Val Venus or I'll just disappear in a lawsuit. <laughs> and so, he's like, he's like, um... Uh, if you want to get ratings by showing nudity, why not let me join in? And they're like, I don't know. Who the hell are you, you bald, muscular man? And he's like, well, I must admit you have me at a disadvantage because I have got out of the shower and I'm just wearing a towel. So if I lose one hand, it's all over for me. And the ladies are like, you got a good point. Your logic irrefutable because what we all want to see is the little Venus. And I'm like, no. <laughs> but what really struck me was that Val Venus, he comes to the impact zone. Okay. The first order of business is he's like, I need a shower. <laughs> so, because I've been working so hard today that he go, he hits the showers and then he just walks around in his towel. So he he just happens upon a strip poker game in his towel and he's like, why not? <laughs> so that is all that amounts to is that Val Venus joins the strip poker game and that's it um, Foley somehow gets into the building and he passes the nasty boys on the way out and Iron Sheik fucking shit himself at seeing Brian fucking Nobbs trying to get into the building and you're like oh my god Hogan actually did get fucking Brian Nobbs and the rest of the nasty boys into TNA. And here's where I really started having a problem. Where you're like, it's good seeing the Nasty Boys back. And then your second reaction is, what the fuck am I saying? No! You're like, you see Hall and X-Pac. You see fucking Kevin Nash. You see the Nasty Boys. Val Venus. And a bunch of other guys who are showing up on this show as really shocking debuts. And you're like... This is terrible. There's no way that I want to see this. Can you imagine tuning in to fucking Impact and watching Hall and X-Pac try to work a match? Can you imagine seeing, na- like now, trying to watch the Nasty Boys work a match? You know, all these guys are at least 12 years past their prime. It's so sad. Like, you do not want to see this. You so don't want to see a Nasty Boys match. Like, we just saw, what was, um, like, Jim Neidhart fight fucking uh, Jay Lethal. And it looks like, oh, oh my god, you did not want to see that Jim Neidhart match. But it's, this is really getting to the point where we have, like, these really washed up old people in these matches. And you so, like, you really fear... For impact, because you're like, for a one-time thing, it was good seeing these guys back, but then you really start fearing, like, what if these guys stay? And you just like, yeah. <laughs> uh, next match, Raven and Dr. Stevie versus Matt Morgan and Hernandez. Uh, the winners are the number one contenders for the tag team championships against the British Invasion at the pay-per-view. And as long as it took me to say that, was longer than the match was because Morgan hits the carbon footprint and kills Stevie in, I shit you not, like 20 seconds. Hey, uh, Stevie, Raven, you know those future endeavors I mentioned? Uh, you might want to hit up Borash and uh, kind of get that resume template kind of figured out because you're on the bus, guys. <laughs> 
Oh, yeah. Then they had the Pope backstage getting interviewed with, with it for his match with Nigel McGuinness, who they are inexplicably calling Desmond Wolf. So, Pope is doing his thing, and then he's interrupted by some guy. And I didn't know who this guy was. He looked familiar, but not in that good way. You're just like, who the fuck is this guy? Strike that, I don't care. And the, this guy, he interrupts for no reason. And he, he's like, good luck with your match. By the way, I'm holding a stacker five-hour energy drink. And he, like, he holds this five-hour energy drink like directly in the camera the whole fucking time. So it was like front and center. And he's like just holding this thing. He's not drinking it. He's just holding it. And so he wishes the Pope luck. Um, and the, the Pope says, if you interrupt my interview time again, I'm, I'm going to show you what a Danny Glover pimp slap, I'm sorry, Massa, feels like. <laughs> and so I was like, who the fuck was that? And so they, like, Taz, thank God, is like, that was Orlando Jordan. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> so <laughs> Orlando Jordan. Woo! You might as well have had Virgil come on screen and be like, that was Virgil! <laughs> and it's like, yay! <laughs> um, so, Pope versus Desmond Wolf. It was a short match, but pretty good. Pope reverses the Tower of London into a small package, and how far Nigel McGuinness has fallen. He, you know, I, I really don't think they're going to do anything with Nigel anymore if he's jobbing to the Pope. And he's jobbing clean to the Pope. I, I just don't know. Um, Rhino's been taken out backstage. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, they go backstage. Uh, AJ says, Borash is interviewing AJ Styles. AJ says he won't really feel like a world champ until he actually beats Kurt Angle at Genesis. The Bish comes in and says, that's not happening at Genesis. It's happening tonight because we got to pop the rating. We're going to do a pay-per-view match tonight. Um, Jeff Jarrett comes down, starts taking credit for starting the company, building new stars, bringing Hogan back, basically wastes about 10 minutes of fucking time. Hogan comes on screen and then starts cutting this heel promo on the guy, or at least it comes across as a heel promo because he gets booed the fuck out of the building. He's like, don't give us this crap about how you saved the business, brother. You may have started TNA, but you also drove it in the fucking ground, brother. And so they're like, boo! And he's like, um... He's like, he's, he says, Hogan is Dixie, Dixie Carter's new partner, and Jared is out. He's got no stroke now, so he's going to have to lace up his boots and wrestle guys. And I didn't know you could make Jeff Jarrett do that, <laughs> but whatever. And I really don't need to see Jeff Jarrett in the ring again. I'm sorry, I don't. Um, see, backstage, Jeff Hardy is painting. I don't get it either, but this does pay off. Because later in the night, uh, Jeff Hardy and Shannon Moore leave the arena holding, like, golden envelopes, saying, like, we finally got what we wanted! We, we've we made it, dude! And we don't know what's in the envelopes, but you're kind of thinking it's a contract. And you're like... And so Jeff is like, yeah, we'll see. Because I might be going to jail pretty soon. He doesn't say that jail part, but he might be going to jail soon. <laughs> so um, then all of a sudden, three shrieking teenage girls come back and they're like, we love you, Jeff Hardy! Can we have your autograph? So somehow these three teenage girls penetrated the Impact Zone's impossible security, which I guess is not too hard because everyone is penetrating the Impact Zone lately, from Mick Foley to the Nasty Boys to fucking X-Pac. But so, you know, what's three teenage girls? And so Jeff Hardy's like, here, girls, I got better than an autograph. Have my shitty painting. And so they're like, eee! and they run off, and you're like, that was weird. So, um, Chris Abyss versus Samoa Joe. I'm fairly sure this was announced as a barbed wire match, and now it's not anymore. Because it was, it was originally Chris Abyss versus Rhino, but Rhino got killed backstage, and so now it's Samoa Joe. So, Joe cheats with a chair shot, Abyss taps out to the choke, big deal. Um, what really drew my attention during this match is they shilled, uh, in the middle of the match, Hulk Hogan TNA trading cards with Dixie Carter on them for thirty nine ninety nine on the TNA website. And I was just like, it's going on my wish list! 
You, know, you missed out, guys. You could have put this in just in time for the holiday season. You know, the perfect stocking stuffer. The Hulk Hogan, Dixie Carter, Impact Trading Cards. Woo! <laughs> um, uh, Crystal tra- tracks down the Bish and demands to see Hogan so that Bobby Lashley can get his release. Um, the Bish tells her to get in line and check the attitude. And Crystal says, You are messing with powers you cannot begin to understand, my man. Because Bobby Lashley is the biggest star that TNA has ever had. And I'm like, yeah. And he's asking for an early release from his contract. So, why should we give it to you? And so that was where the seven kind of petered out. Was Bish was like, yeah, um, fuck you. <laughs> and so she goes. Um... The Nasty Boys break into Team 3D's locker room and start trashing it. I hate calling them Team 3D because they're the Dudley Boys. Uh, the Dudley Boys are not there because they're in Japan dropping the IWGP Tag Team titles. I know, you don't care. The funny part of this was the security guard who initially locked the Nasty Boys out comes back in as they're trashing the room, apologizes, says he didn't know they were so close to Hogan, and as a peace offering, brought them a box of donuts. The Nasty Boys... Pimp slapped the box of donuts away and said, Fuck your donuts. We want pizza and wings. So they start trashing the room, demanding pizza, and then on their way out, they're like, Fuck your donuts. And they pick up the donuts and start eating them anyway. <laughs> you know, it's like, this is so bizarre. But it's still better than DX and the Midget. <laughs> Please don't make them wrestle. <sighs> Um, the TNA World Heavyweight Championship. This is the last. This is it. Um, so, this they put on a pay per view quality match. Was very good, and I hate to complain about a match this good, but I will. Um, during the match, some masked weirdo. Oh, I'm sorry. No, let me back up a little bit. So, Bubba the Love Sponge, um, before this match, finds that beer money has been laid out backstage. And so it, it kind of occurred to me that Bubba has actually, Bubba the Love Sponge has discovered, he just stumbled upon about three whole tag teams who have been destroyed backstage, and he's starting to look kind of like a suspicious likely suspect. Maybe Bubba the Love Sponge is tougher than we expected. But no, um, during the World Heavyweight Championship match, some dude in, like, covered head to toe in black in a ski mask attacks AJ, but Angle throws him out of the ring. Angle's like, get the fuck out. I want this match to be legit. So they throw the masked man out. Security chases him away. And so they restart the match. It's not a DQ. He helps AJ up, and we're like, we're going to do this, man. We're going to do this legit. And so in WWE, they'd have thrown the match out. But they're like, this. the refereeing in TNA is kind of bizarre sometimes. So they're like, like, as as illustrated in the Steel Asylum match. But they're like, fuck it, we'll keep going. It wasn't really that bad, so we'll keep going. So, during this match, the the impact crowd, which increases which increasingly pisses me off, starts chanting, Who needs Brett? Weird chant, guys. Who started that? Who needs Brett? You do. <laughs> you wish you had Brett. I, I, I don't know. Um, also during the match, Ric Flair comes out to watch, and he stands on the stage, kind of does this thing where he's watching. Really takes away from the match, actually, because everyone looks over and they're like, "That's Ric Flair," and so they're watching fucking Rick, and they're not watching the really awesome match going on. And then Rick just kind of leaves. He doesn't leave after the match. He leaves before the hot finish. He's like he stands out there for like three, four minutes, and then he's like, "I've seen enough." Woo! And then he leaves, and the crowd is like, "Rick's leaving," and they're still watching Rick, and they're not watching the match. And then Rick leaves, and they're like they keep kind of watching the aisle because like, is Rick coming back? Is the match man coming back? You know, it, it, you're kind of distracting the audience from a really good match. And so I, I really thought it kind of detracted from the match to have Rick Flair come out, do nothing except distract people, and then leave. So Rick Flair didn't really amount to anything. I'm guessing he'll come back. Um, and so here's where I complain about a really good match. In a pay-per-view match, you tend to have people kick out of each other's finishers. Um, probably the best match that I remember seeing on pay-per-view like that was Rock versus Austin, where they actually did the very rare and hard-to-pull-off 
face, like double face turn and heel turn, where the heel becomes face and the face becomes heel, where Austin and Rock kind of switch places, where it turns out that Austin was with the man all the whole time. They did this thing where they kicked out of each other's finishers. So, like, you know, Austin hits the stunner, Rock kicks out. Austin hits the rock bottom, Rock kicks out. And then Rock does the same thing where he hits his finisher and they hits. It. So they kicked out of, like, every permutation of the finisher. And so they started doing things where so they had to kind of double up on finishers. They did this thing where they each kicked out of each other's finishers. Then they kicked out of everyone's super finishers where, like, Angle hit the Olympic slam off the top rope and AJ kicks out. And they're like, oh my God, this is the greatest match I've ever seen in my life. And so, so Styles is doing he hits the Styles Clash doesn't get it hits the Styles Clash again doesn't get it Angle eats three Styles Clashes and the Springboard 450 Splash finally stays down and I was like you know you can put a guy a little too over when you have the guy kick out of like three Styles Clashes that's a bit much so I don't know. I was like, that's all. You made the guy. You're kind of testing the audience with these near falls where you're like, you can kind of have a guy kick out of a Styles Clash. Two, you're like, oh my God. But, you know, the crowd is going to start calling bullshit on you eventually. Um, so, the masked dude didn't really pay off at all. But in a way, that's kind of good. You, I'm kind of tired of angles immediately kind of paying off. Where you're like, you kind of expect a long-term thing nowadays. And you don't get it. You know, here's where my PVR cut off. So, I got kind of mad, but I looked online, um, found some video clips. And so, what happened after the, the title match was Foley finally gets into Hogan's office. And he sees Bischoff sitting in Foley's old chair. And Bischoff says, you are no longer the executive shareholder. And just like everyone else, you've got to earn your place, Mick. So you got to lace up your wrestling boots and fight for your job. And I, how the hell does that work? I didn't know you could just do that to an executive shareholder of a company. Like, There's economics at play here. I think Foley might have been privy to this kind of information if somebody all of a sudden became the executive shareholder. I, I didn't know you could just kind of say, like, you're not anymore, ha And I didn't know you could make a shareholder wrestle. And I know I'm complaining about people being forced to wrestle on a wrestling program, but one, Mick Foley doesn't really need to wrestle anymore. I don't need to see it. And two, I didn't know you could make an executive shareholder wrestle. It just seems weird. It'd be like, Dixie Carter, you're no longer president of TNA, and you got to wrestle to fit in just like everybody else. And Dixie's like, all right. <laughs> it just kind of seems weird to me how like anyone anywhere can wrestle. WWE is the same thing, too. I remember when, uh, when CM Punk had a problem with the referee Scott Armstrong. And uh, hang on a second. So they had a, uh, sorry, I had to check my uh, microphone. Um, Scott Armstrong, they're like, uh, you've got to wrestle. And Scott's like, why? And they're like, because you'll lose your job if you don't. And Scott's like, I don't really think you can make me wrestle. But they're like, yeah, we can. So they made a referee wrestle. I'd, apparently in wrestling, anyone who's in the building, fair game. Uh, that's wrestling logic for you sometimes. Yeah. But, um. Foley says he promised himself a long time ago that he would never work for Eric Bischoff again, and if he's going to be fired anyway, he might as well give him a reason. So he kind of tools up his fist to punch him, and then Nash, Hall, and X-Pac come in, lay him out, and then Hogan comes in, he's like, oh, no, no. And so that's how it faded out. So, uh, let's see. The, the final notes I had was, it was fun seeing all the old characters return, but believe me, you do not want to see any of these old cripple fuckers in the ring again. <laughs> Can, do you really think X-Pac and Hall can still go? Jesus Christ. Those were my last words on that one. Um, yeah. So, what? how to sum up the wrestling. I found Raw to be very boring. I found it to be very anticlimactic. Um, I thought Bret Hart's return, for the moment at least, was wasted. And I know I, I was the one who really hated to bring up the specter of Montreal who doesn't really want to bring that the specter of Owen Hart. But I wish they'd done something. 
you know, set something up. They, they don't need to bring back Montreal to say, like, you know what, Sean? I don't like you, and I'm going to make you wrestle in shitty matches. Or, like, I'm going to put you... Like, I'm not going to give you The Undertaker for WrestleMania. I'm going to give you some other match. Or building up to some match with Vince McMahon. Something. There's something. They didn't give me anything. The matches were okay, but nothing great. I'm kind of tired of seeing DX. I, that's just my own fatigue. Uh, actually, I thought the Sheamus Evan Braun match was really good. Um, but TNA was a much better show this week. And I will rarely say that. And so, again, this is another example where I hate when people say I go into something with a bad attitude, committed not to liking it, and then make myself not like a good thing. Because I went into Impact pretty devoted to hating it, because I've hated Impact for years now, and it was pretty good. Now, I had problems with it, but that's me. I'm a critic. I nitpick things. But it was a really good show. It was better than Raw. Um... There were bad things. The Steel Asylum match was total horseshit. And this is kind of... The bad refereeing, the bad booking is kind of an uh, iconic of Impact for a long time. And I gotta tell you, I've got bad feelings about the future of this company with Hogan in charge, or at least with, with Hogan being a major guest star. Because you don't want to see the matches coming down the pike for this one. You You don't. You don't. Because if you're actually happy about Scott Hall, X Pac, the Nasty Boys, Orlando Jordan, and you know Jeff Hardy's the one guy you might be happy to see back, but I wouldn't get used to it. I really don't know what Jeff is thinking because he kind of had a good thing going with the WWE. I, I and I don't know how much longer he's going to stay out of jail. <laughs> I don't know. Um, really, I think what really bugs me about TNA right now is Nigel McGuinness. Because I was really hoping to see him in, in uh, WWE, and I really think he made a bad move going to TNA. And I think even Nigel is starting to realize that, because I think he might be jobbing for some time now until his contract's up. Uh, and I hate Desmond Wolf. I hate the name. It's really cheesy and really bad, especially since they've got Desmond Wolf saying really shitty things. Like, with a name like Desmond Wolf, the first thing you think is like... Uh, Please don't make him make wolf puns. Don't give him a catchphrase that has to do with wolves. And sure enough, his catchphrase is, you will bow to the howl, and you just... It's bad. But I've gone on a very long time talking about wrestling. Probably going to be the last time for a while, unless there is an epically bad show. And I'll tell you. But in terms of Monday... I will simply close by saying... In terms of Monday Night War, I kind of called it a Monday Night War. It's not. Um, TNA is still very small fry compared to WWE. And it's not like back in the day when WCW was backed by Turner. You know, when there was actually a significant financial juggernaut behind WCW. They were stealing talent from the WWE you know, there were people jumping ship, there was a lot of controversy, you know, invasions and things like that. WWE is not worried, and they shouldn't be. I mean, yeah, they they may have swiped Jeff Hardy out from under their nose, but, you know, Jeff wasn't under contract anyway. Um, you know, they swiped Orlando Jordan. Woo. You know, they got Ric Flair, but they're kind of done with Ric Flair. I'm kind of done with Ric Flair. And so, you might have expected some kind of big debut, big controversy, and really, it was just a bunch of old people. And that was kind of the downfall of WCW, was it had a lot of old people who were washed up back then. Like, Hogan, Hall, and Nash were washed up when WCW went under. Those guys should have retired back then. I know I may get some heat for this, but like... Ric Flair probably should have retired back then. And, you know, it was called wheelchair wrestling for a reason, because you had old people dominating the top of the business, and nobody ever got over. It was just NWO all the fucking time. And so, you know, raising the specter of the NWO in TNA, not a good thing. Really not. Especially when your NWO is comprised of X-Pac and Hall. (laughs) Oof. 
And Kevin Nash, who's been a, just about the biggest waste of time in TNA for a long time, because as much as I've said Carlito stopped trying, Hall, has, has he ever tried? <laughs> I don't know if he's... He, he played everything so low. Anyway. So, I liked it, but I'm not really that optimistic towards the future on TNA. Um, I, I really think, you know, competition would do wrestling good, but I really don't think TNA is competition right now. I, I think the better wrestling going on is Ring of Honor, and Ring of Honor is not even really competition. I am excited. To, I, I've heard something about Brian Danielson coming to the WWE. Would love to see that. I, I hope it's soon, because they need new stars. They need better talent, because the WWE's big problem right now is that you've seen the same old shit for, what, five years more? Where it's been dominated by Triple H, John Cena, Randy Orton, and The Undertaker. You know, Batista. The same stuff for way too long. And so they desperately need injection of new blood. And they're kind of killing that new blood. Like they were trying to breed a new star with Kofi Kingston. And Kofi is kind of back to mid-card doing nothing now. Kind of jobbing to Orton now. And so that's really disappointing. And so they really need to work on new stars. And that's why the Sheamus thing is a good thing. But at the same time, it's kind of hard for the audience to buy into that. It's kind of hard for them to believe that there's a new star, you know, like somebody can be put over established superstars because th- they really don't think, like, John Cena's been put over so strongly for so long, they don't really, get, they just don't believe that it'll last. So when Sheamus wins, their reaction is, fucking Sheamus? Who the fuck is this guy? So don't get me wrong, I applaud the, the, the bold decision to put the title on a new guy. Maybe too new, but I can't fault him on that. Uh, I, I like it. I like Sheamus. I really do. Um, and I hope they stick with him. Really do. But they need to do more. They really need to start phasing out or at least putting over some new guys, and I don't think they're going to do that. I think they're kind of stuck on, like, they're very tunnel vision on one guy, and so if they're going to tunnel vision on one guy, they'll probably tunnel vision on Sheamus focus exclusively on him and do nothing else but like they got so many stars they could breed Evan Bourne could be huge Kofi huge and they got all these other stars that they could bring up uh John Morrison who's not really doing much of anything right now and I think people really believed he was going to be huge too like next world champion if you'd asked me last year who the who the most likely next world champion would be I'd put John Morrison around top of the list and I don't think it's going to happen I in fact I don't think he's going to come close anymore uh, I think he's back to mid-card hell. So, that's my advice. Um, I think it might be time for my medicine. I'm on antibiotics right now. So, thank you for watching. If you're wrestling fans, uh, I think the only people watching right now are the wrestling fans. So, thank you for watching. I hope you, you value my insight, and uh, I value yours, so comments on these videos. Um, keep watching wrestling. Uh, I, I will watch Impact. It, 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 uh, well, I will tell you what. Impact did succeed in that I am very interested to see what happens next week. And I will tune in. So, join me on this, this epic adventure as we watch wrestling for a little while. But it might be a while before I talk about it some more. I might just kind of blog about it, right? Like, write some very brief notes. So, thank you. I will. I am actually doing a bunch of videos right now. I'm not recording anything, but I'm doing a bunch of writing and kind of prep material until my foot gets better and able to walk around a little better. Uh, I might be in a walking cast for a while. So, uh, yeah. Until next time, guys. See you later, brothers.